Good evening uh, and welcome to the Cabinet meeting uh, of Tamil Borough Council on Thursday, the 22nd of February. First item is apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Jeremy Oates, Andrew Cooper and Martin Summers. Um, minutes of the previous meeting, there were two minutes to sign. Is everyone happy that they're a true record? Can I have a move and a seconder for both of them? Yep. Moved by Councillor Clements, seconded by Councillor Smith. All those in favour? Okay, it's carried, thank you. Do we have any declarations of interest? No. Um, question time, there are none from the public. There are no matters referred from um, overview and scrutiny this time. So straight on to the main item, uh, the first main item, which is the corporate vision, priorities, plan, budget and medium term financial strategy. Um, tonight the report is uh, basically to approve the recommended package of budget proposals, um, which are listed here and attached in the appendices, um, to comply with the requirement of the Council's treasure management policy. Um, the recommendations of which there are, let me scroll down, there are 25 recommendations um, that underpin the budget. I'm not going to go through them one by one. We've, we've seen several iterations of this before, so just the latest version. There's been scrutiny, etc. So I propose that we, um, we move them on block, but do we have any questions or comments? No. Thank you. Can I have a move on a set? I'm happy to move. Second, though. Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Next item um, is the corporate review of fees and charges. Um, the two recommendations one is to implement the annual inflation re increase of 5% for the fees and charges where appropriate, um, and two, to endorse increases in the charges applied for goods sold through the catering bar and shops throughout the year as these are based on cost price plus a margin. Um, it seems fairly straightforward, but do we have any questions or comments? No. I'm happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Smith, I think. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Next one, write-offs. Again, just another um, standard one for the period. Um, the, uh, where is it here? Yeah, so the recommendation is just that we approve the write-offs for the period 1st of April 2023 to the 31st of September 2023. Do you have any questions or comments? I'm happy to move. Second by Councillor Smith. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Next item, uh, quarter three performance report. Um, this provides us an overview of Council's performance for the third quarter of the financial year, October to December supports the Council's position in relation to progress with strategic corporate plan projects and updates on the final position, corporate risks, audits, information governance and complaints. As is customary, it was considered by the Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting that was held on the 7th of February. Um, the points they asked are included in here. Um, it was actually quite a, uh, I suppose, quite a simple meeting because the report is very good and things are in a very good position. So there wasn't much um, in way that came from scrutiny. So things are looking good. Do you have any comments or questions? I'm happy to move. We have a second there. Councillor Thompson, I think, beat you that time. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Um, now, this one here is for Councillor Summers. It's a report of the portfolio holder for environmental health and community partnerships. It's the Emergency and Business Continuity Planning and Civil Contingencies Unit paper. But we do have the officer, Tina Mustafa, here, so I'll hand over to you if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Cabinet. So on behalf of the portfolio, I hold them for um, for this for this report of environmental health and community partnerships. This sets out our duties under the civil contingencies legislation um, for em emergency planning and business continuity planning in the event of a major incident um, as defined under the Civil Contingencies Act. Um, and as a, a, a category one responder, we're required to work with the civil contingencies unit through the Staffordshire Resilience Partnership to ensure that we're prepared in that eventuality. So this report broadly does two things in terms of the recommendations. It sets out a detailed rag rated improvement plan covering um, every one of those plans and procedures that we would follow in a major incident um, and with progress against that, which is routinely reported through the Council's corporate management team. 
um, and that sets out sort of housekeeping really around um, our uh, update in terms of that and as you can see that they're on track or in progress we have actually bought additional capacity within the civil contingency contingencies unit to accelerate that work um, so we're pleased to report that that's progressing well um, but the second report is to delegate the second recommendation rather is to delegate authority to um, councillor summers to um, develop a set of frequently asked questions and communications guidance for members on what your role would be in the event of a major incident because often members are you know you're at the forefront of sometimes hearing about what's going on on social media etc often you're informally and um, you know unfairly sometimes used as forward control in those types of situations and we need just to support all our members um, in that local role so together with the civil contingencies unit using the guidance that's attached to this report from the um, you know from the from the, the recognized body then we will be developing that through member seminars with yourselves around the do's and don'ts of what to do in a major incident you know it's as simple as you know do not share information until we know what's actually happening because things are dynamic and happen very quickly don't they so so the report does what it says on the team it updates you in terms of our preparedness and hopefully gives you reassurance in terms of that but then it also um, suggests that we'll be bringing forward further proposals on member protocols in terms of communications that start with the leader you know all the way through so happy to take any questions chair thank you very much um, that seems quite straightforward do you have any questions Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. I'm just reading through, um, you know, the risk and the mitigation. How do we actually practice this? Is it tabletops and then, you know, exercising with our partners? Is that how we go about uh, dealing with the things? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and there is, as part of the improvement plan, a whole training um, and needs element to that project if you like um, at the moment there's a range of ccu civil contingencies unit hosted exercises we participated in exercise fortitude not long ago which deals with like you know a meteoric fall that cuts out all the electric for example and they're usually hosted at police or fire headquarters um, so there's those large-scale multi-agency events that we always participate in um, but the intention is also to have some local tests as well of our um, reception and uh, rest centres because uh, you'll see from the report that we've got a whole network of local venues that we would use. So based on the nature, scale and impact of the emergency, that would determine what we used and where and we want to test whether that would work in practice. So yeah, that is also part of the commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Just a comment. Yep. Um, just for Councillor Thompson's uh, question, we did do an exercise with the um, the flats, um, the buildings after Grenfell. Um, we there was lots of emergency emergency vehicles around, and social media was going mad. And it was actually just an exercise that was uh, just how we would evacuate people coming out how we would deal uh, with the fire and the shoots and stuff like that. So it, we do do those exercises. Yep. Yeah, just a <clears throat> brief question. Um, there's, there's obviously been quite a number of incidents lately in terms of flooding um, and, and high water levels. I was just wondering if there's anything that can be specifically said that's been concentrated on that might alleviate the fears of some residents. Thank you, Councillor Smith. So you'll see in the improvement plan that there is a flood plan in there specifically to respond to those kind of eventualities. Um, that is already um, already exists. The civil contingencies unit are updating that routinely. We're all on the flood alerts for the town. Um, and where there's a need for what they call a TAM, a tactical assessment meeting, then the Civil Contingencies Unit will host that and multi-agencies will attend that with the environmental, you know, the environmental teams, etc. Um, but very often, I think the risk around some of the social media 
is that there is a suggestion that there is flood risk but actually in reality it's being monitored and it's below the the levels it tends to be surface surface water sometimes rather than flood water um, but in answer to your question there is a flood plan it is under constant update and the communications we follow the fire service and the ccu lead in terms of those support messages as you know from the last uh, incident where the leader helpfully put stuff out about that. So yeah, thank you. Okay, Andrew Barrett. Th thank you, Chair. Just really in response to Councillor Thompson's um, sort of question around has it been put into practice? Um, we've had quite a few cases of things like the uh, the water pumps um, not functioning at the high rise. So we've organised water deliveries and things like that. So a lot of the stuff is. I say business as usual, but it's been it, it's it's in train. What what the plan seeks to do is actually give it a bit more structure, and I think very importantly, it's it's there for elected members so as they know what's happening. This this is the sort of thing that seems to happen in the background, <coughs> but as ambassadors, it's really really important that, that, that the role of elected members is is clear, so uh, you know you, you can act as um, you know as a way of communicating the the right message out to the right people, um, as uh, Tina's just highlighted. Quite often, the social media message isn't always the right one, and that can lead everybody to get quite excited, and potentially it can lead us to send the wrong resources to the wrong place. So it's very, very important that we uh, we keep sort of keep the structure around it. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Just to come back to you on that one, so that the, the example you used there, that the water pumps, for example, if we have a live scenario, I'm assuming you take the learnings from that and then adapt this to. All right, any other questions? A mover or seconder? Moved by Councillor Smith. I think that was Councillor Thompson seconded. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Thank you, team, <laughs> as well. Uh, next one is a report of the Portfolio Holder for Housing and Planning, which is the Housing Revenue Account Business Plan 23-24 to 2053-54. So over to Councillor Smith, please. Yeah, this is um, so an assessment of where we are with the HRA. Um, it's a 30-year uh, scope. Um, there, there's obviously quite a, a, quite a lot of data that's been produced uh, also externally. Um, the data, uh, I just before moving on to, 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 to the assistant director, I just thought I'd go through some snippets. Um, so, First thing I wanted to say was, in terms of what was coming out of the consultants, um, we've obviously got higher costs uh, from inflation, and uh, of course there's additional spending requirements, um, and to, to, to deliver the sort of stock investment um, uh, in in the homes uh, within the HRA, uh, we've we've got constrained income. Um, an example would be from from rent capping. Uh, we've got, um, j just generally I'd say we've got to be careful and we've got to minimise costs where we can um, and assess the impact of, of any new projects that come along um, and we've just got to do what we can to respond to any emerging risks um, and certainly um, take every opportunity to capture any potential that comes out of it, any opportunities. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was, which was from the uh, housing business plan, um, some, some, some things that I think it's important to, to mention so that residents are aware of things that we need to do better on and are currently doing uh, well on as well, I would say. Um, so assess the condition of the council's housing stock on a more regular basis. I think that's extremely important given not just the regulations, but you know, just a whole host of reasons. Um, and we are appointing a named senior officer uh, who has the responsibility of overseeing uh, health and safety of the council's tenants. Improve the energy efficiency of housing, housing stock, council housing stock and develop and implement plans to decarbonize uh, the council's housing stock. Um, one of the recommendations, actually, the seven recommendations, mentions um, 
writing to the Department of Levin uh, Communities and Housing, um, the, the reality is the long-term HRA is going to struggle with the kind of uh, money that is required for decarbonisation. Um, so there are challenges to uh, the, uh, once you get to about uh, 27, 28 years, 27, 28, um, we got some challenges there. Um, the most important thing I can say is that we don't want to make any uh, rash decisions uh, in the short term to reduce any spending that hits the most vulnerable in Tamworth. I think that's incredibly important. But part of um, you know what I'll be doing is is putting as much pressure as possible on the government to uh, to to potentially. Um, provide more information in terms of decarbonisation and what can be achieved and any any uh, assistance that can be provided. So that's my uh, little uh, summary, uh, um, if I can pass back on. Okay, thank you. So, so is the proposal to move the seven on block? Yep. Yes. Do you have any questions? I've got a question on, um, where is it? Number six. So, so writing to the government to essentially tell them about the financial challenges and look for more funding, I suppose, is the ultimate aim. Do we have any precedent or anything that's happened in the past where we've we've done that and the outcome? Have we had any outcome from it? It has been done before. Uh, has it made any difference? I think um, limited is probably the diplomatic answer. Um, it's been successful in previous cases around support for grants and, and things like that. Um, I'm not aware it's ever been successful in core funding issues. Obviously, uh, government's in a similar position to ourselves with they have a limited budget that gets allocated in a limited fashion. So um, I think that's probably the on honest answer that, that, that I'd give on that. Okay, so my supp a supplementary to that then is, I'm assuming we're we're not alone in this. So, is there any merit in j joining forces with other neighbouring authorities that are in the same position to have you know a, a, a bigger voice when we do that? I, I think um, and I won't steal Tina's thunder, but there's various associations that we're affiliated with, specifically related to housing, that are doing some really, really good, really good job of this. There's also the LGA who are lobbying on our behalf. There's a district council network which is lobbying on our behalf, and this is on the wider local government finance. So I think there's an awful lot of activity happening to try and get the uh, the voice of um, district and county councils um, into into government, particularly from the there is a, a now an acknowledgement of the services particularly districts provide wider than just housing that came through 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 covid i think there's a, there's an ear with government that we do deliver a lot of the things that everybody assumes just happens and and that has to be funded so uh, i'm not saying there's an open door but that there's continued lobbying there uh, as you've probably seen from the many circulars that um, you know that, that, that get banded around don't know if there's anything you want to add tina Th thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. Um, just to say that this document puts us in a really good position for that conversation, with the, certainly from the regulator, um, given that this form part, forms part of our new social housing regulatory, reform, uh, regulatory preparedness programme for inspection. And you're absolutely right, we are now different to a lot of organisations who are struggling to meet the investment needs. So what you see is that the 30-year forecast which, as you know, it's a set of levers. It's about risk management rather than, you know, setting anything in stand for that period. But what you see is it balances till 2042, 2043. Then we've got 36 million um, or thereabouts deficit and the potential for 385 million in unsupported borrowing. Now, when you look at the figures, you'll see that the level of investment for decarbonisation is 113 million of that which that puts us in a strong position when we speak to the regulator about you know whether we're able to achieve their net zero targets in relation to our stock and i've sat you know with the regulator <coughs> on rp boards and had that conversation and i think we will see you know sort of a different approach in terms of how they how they're going to support authorities whether it's the private sector or 
local authorities meeting that going forward. But what this proposes, because it puts tenants and leaseholders at the heart of the decision making, the consultation draft that you've got in front of you is about having that conversation with tenants and leaseholders about where they want to prioritise areas for reducing expenditure or raising income so that we start to do that wider and deeper exploration with them in support of it but there's no two ways about it you know the business plan cannot sustain that level of investment and the financial analysis there will help us evidence that thank you thank you yeah it's quite clear that the, it's, the, it's the new net zero and stuff that skews it towards the latter part is there has there been any talk about sort of new burdens money or anything because you know it, it's totally new it's been put onto us no okay thank you yeah, one thing I was going to say was we had quite a lengthy um, housing and homelessness advisory board meeting uh, where the consultants uh, went through this in quite uh, detail. Uh, one of the things that I remember coming out from that meeting was actually we're doing pretty much everything that we can do. It's fairly resilient at the moment. Um, uh, any sort of efficiencies uh, are are getting there if not there um so we're not we're not in a short term we're not in an awful situation but certainly there's a lot we can do um to try and mitigate any uh burdens or risk in the future okay thank you any other comments or questions no are you moving some yeah okay second off all those in favor thank you very much And then the final item tonight is the, re the report of the Portfolio of Housing Planning again, Councillor Smith, which is local plan progression options. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um I went through this uh, in quite a bit of detail uh, at ISAG, which um, successfully uh, made its way through. Um, so just, just to kind of outline a few things, just in case anybody wasn't aware, um, we're essentially talking about a situation where we have a, um, a current um, uh, local development scheme, uh, which is in contrast to what's been set out by the government um, in terms of the set transitionary arrangements. So what it currently is, is that we've, we've had the issues and options consultation. Uh, that was a year or so ago. Um, we, had, we were to have the preferred options consultation um, early this year, and then late uh, next year would be the submission to the planning inspectorate, uh, the draft one. Um, but the transitionary arrangements uh, are for the submission of the plans to be due next year um, and the plans to be adopted at the end of 26. Um, so there's a slight uh, contrast there. So um, we, we had, uh, we've had the local plan working group. Uh, there were a number of uh, options available uh, which are set out in the report. Um, we've gone for... Um, uh, th there is a preferred option, as you can see on the report. Um, they're quite detailed, the, the, the options here, but um, it's been thoroughly sort of spoken about, talked about, not just in that working group, but at various committees. Um, and we've, we've ended on a, on a sensible uh, way forward um, to essentially admit the, um, the preferred option consultation stage and to go straight into what we can do. For the for the for a preparation for the submission, but I'm sure Anna will um, go in a bit more detail. Thank you. I'm not sure how much more I can add, but essentially, what the government's done it's changed guidance um, since we started a full review of the local plan. So we've got the regeneration, leveling up, and regeneration bill, which is now enacted. So it's an act, and it's changed the landscape a little bit in terms of plan production. So it's given local authorities a choice. You can either continue under existing regulations um, or you can transition to the new ones that will be 
as a result of the new act that's that's come out. If we go through under existing regulations, we have to submit our plan for examination by June 25, which is a much shorter timescale than the one that we were envisaging. Hence why we've needed to redo the local development scheme and statement of community involvement, which form part of this report to reflect that and technically fast track the new local plan production to meet that timescale, which is which is a challenge. And so we're emitting a non statutory uh, milestone and um, a, a stage out of local plan production to, to try and meet it. Um, or we could, you know, carry on um, with uh, the new transitionary arrangements. Unfortunately, the government hasn't produced primary legislation or guidance to allow us to use that new act, which causes us a problem. So in consultation and with discussions with government directly, um, the timetable for that new guidance is the end of this year, which means basically not doing a great deal if we wanted to use that route. So I think we had a very clear steer from the working group, which is carry on, do what you can, try and get it through using this particular option, which will try and fast track to um, submission for examination by, by June. So we've had a number of conversations with legal, also with the planning inspectorate, just to give us some reassurances that omitting this particular non-statutory stage is um, acceptable, um, and it is, it's not without risk, but there we have now subsequently found out that a number of authorities are also doing the same thing, um, and it's a bit, of a, a bit of a gallop to the finish line to meet these sort of transitionary arrangements. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, if the goalposts do change a little bit with the government, because things are, you know, changing all the time, uh, there might be, uh, we might want to revisit and do the um, options consultation, isn't it? So if we've obviously got the time and resources to do that. I think whatever work we do isn't wasted. And if we have to pivot for whatever reason, the guidance comes out, um, or perhaps we can't make it, perhaps we need to do something different. There are always changes that come in left field with local plan production, which makes you often reevaluate what it is that you're delivering. So, you know, if we have to pivot, then we can, but as long as we've got something started, um, I think that puts us in a better position for doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, certainly reading it through, it seems to be the option that makes the most sense at the moment. Um, reassuring about the legal advice and then doubly reassuring that other local authorities seem to be doing the same so it seems it seems fairly low risk do we have any other questions or comments uh thank you chair i'd just like to say when i read the report i thought it was such an in-depth report uh, full of detail um lots of options in there everything being considered uh, it's obviously been underpinned by some hard work so i'd just like to say congratulations to councillor smith anna and her team it was a real real Good report to bring forward so thank you yeah totally agree thank you Dr. Smith yeah I'll just I'll just have an, add a name to that Richard Powell's done an absolutely fab job as well as with working with Anna as well on this so I just wanted to mention that okay thank you any other comments or questions you happy to move Councillor Smith yeah second Councillor Thompson all those in favour thank you very much and I believe that brings us to the yes, it does bring us to the end of the meeting. Um, thank you very much.